first 10 or 15 years of the crisis line, we started to see occasionally when we had extra staff or volunteers that there was a need to actually go out and meet people where they were. Uh, and so first we called it the bummer squad because these people were having a bummer. And, <laughs> right. You know, we'd drive out in a station wagon and, and go help them out, give them a ride somewhere, talk them down, give them some water, and just kind of sit with them until they were back on earth. And, uh, and the community was really appreciating that and there started to be more and more demand for that in-person crisis intervention. And in 1988, the city of Eugene and the police department approached Whiteberg Clinic about a collaboration with this new concept called community policing. And, and we were born out of that. Uh, we, since our inaugural truck shift on July 4th, 1989, we've always staffed our vans with an EMT, basic or higher, and a crisis worker with you know, a combination of experience and education. And so we ran, started off kind of Monday through Friday for the first 10 or 15 years, and then uh, in the late 90s, early 2000s, that increased to 12 hours a day, seven days a week. And then in 2010, we added a second van to our fleet in Eugene for a total 24-hour 24 24 service hours a day, spread over a 16-hour period, just so we could have overlap during peak hours. Uh, and then in the, gosh, what was that? And then in 2014, we added Springfield, which is our you know city just on the other side of the river, to our programming. And then over the last year, we've actually increased our presence in both cities to 24 hours a day with overlap in Eugene, because this is the bigger city, uh, during our peak service hours. Uh, so you have an additional van in Springfield? Yeah. So right now, we actually have three vans out. Right now, we have two operating in Eugene, uh, because there's some busy morning hours. And then we have a, our team in Springfield, too. Uh, and we also now have uh, a a program that every two days a week goes out with our downtown foot patrol uh, in Eugene and identifies their their most uh, frequent offenders and instead of arresting them or even ticketing them for you know illegal camping or open container it's hey like you're out here every day like we got cahoots team here can they talk to you about getting into treatment or detox or you know you keep talking about how you've got that family in Salt Lake City that you really want to get back to can we get you on a bus? And, and really, it, it's been just incredible in reducing the costs of, uh, you know, law enforcement and, and all the other things that go into really, you know, uh, criminally enforcing, you know, the, the laws against so these So am I hearing you saying that it's just not noticing them, but getting to know them and they're yeah. trusting you enough that yeah. you're really someone that they would listen to and, and speak right. with. Right, because, you know, we're prob we, we've probably seen them to give them a blanket or, yeah. you know, a bottle of water or, or we've talked them through crises or helped them get to other services in the past. And so they have they have rapport with us already. Uh, the, the officers that work the downtown patrol spend a lot of time relationship building too. And so we're able to kind of come at it from, you know, from both angles and really provide a lot of case management. Uh, the, when we started this last year, we had 30 folks that we really wanted to try and get some help for. And I believe 28 of them are housed either independently or in some sort of supported living situation now. And, you know, there's a whole new batch of people because, you know, it's really almost like there's a placeholder. But it's been remarkably successful uh, just just in that. Uh, the CAHOOTS program, just kind of as our mobile crisis, we're responding to over 20,000 calls a year. Uh, so if you do the math, it comes down to about two and a half calls an hour uh, that we're responding to. Uh, you know, we're diverting folks from the ER. Uh, we're helping prevent things from escalating to need law enforcement or even higher medical care. Uh, you know, we're able to do early interventions with families, do mediation. Um, we do the welfare checks so that the police don't have to, unless there's you know certain details that make it unsafe. Uh, it's like for us. that's like health and safety checks. Yeah, like yeah. Uh, you know, like your your neighbor's newspapers are piling up, you yeah. know, and the cat's meowing, and so they're gonna have us go and check, you know, and see if we can see what's going on. Maybe maybe they're just really sick, and you know, they need an EMT to check their vitals, and you know, we end up getting to the hospital for treatment. I read about your program about the hardest part of the job is finding people that have actually died and then having yeah. to go to their family members and tell them that. Yeah, yeah. That, that was always the most impactful uh, for me uh, because discoveries are challenging in, them, in and of themselves, but then having to go you know, inform the family, uh, it's an honor to be there you know, for that initial grief and be able to support them, uh, you know, but it's also really hard. Yeah. You know, uh, there's really nothing about this job that's easy.
Right. So what do you do with the people that are working that go through that experience? Do you have some sort we have, of coaching? We have a clinical supervisor that meets with folks for one-on-one -on -one, uh, debrief and supervision, uh, but then we also have uh, weekly staff meetings where we, we hold space for a debrief about those things. And, do some critical incident. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, and, but then there's also, so this is our team that's getting ready to go out and do outreach. Um, there's also a lot of uh, debrief and processing that happens during shift. So if, if we have one of those really hard calls, you know, then we're going to tell dispatch that we need, we need 10 or 15 minutes and we'll go get a cup of coffee and, you know, sweep out the van and kind of talk, you know, talk about it for a little while. Yeah. Uh, we also do all of our reports immediately after the call. Um, so that gives us a little bit of time to breathe and, you know, just, just pause for a moment. So, so you got a call? We're actually headed downtown to do some outreach. Uh -huh. We're uh, part, of the, part of the special downtown initiative to try to do a little more case management with EPD. So, the, the, so we, we stay as a team. So Matt and Chelsea, the medic and crisis worker, we stay together and then they'll be basically on foot patrol with two uh, downtown officers and they're going to you know, take the backpack full of first aid supplies with them and some bottles of water and some business cards and kind of check in with folks, introduce themselves. Because uh, downtown is really close to both the Greyhound and the Amtrak station. And so we get a lot, that's kind of, and this, the public library is right there. So that's kind of this nexus of folks that when yeah. they first get to Eugene, they're going to end up in that downtown area. In the core. Yeah, right. Uh, but then there's also kind of a, um, a target list of folks that we're trying to do case management with. Um, so when I was doing the outreach last Thursday, uh, you know, we started off and we had a list of folks, okay, this guy needs a new wheelchair. Uh, you know, this one was really interested in going to behavioral health and talking with them about getting, you know, a therapist and, you know, getting back on their meds. And so we were actually looking for those folks and when we found them, we'd give them a ride to behavioral health or we'd give them a ride to, uh, you know, to where we could get them a new wheelchair. But we're designated as a mobile clinic, so what that means is uh, we can our EMTs can provide oxygen um, if it's necessary for a medical intervention, but we can't transport while they're on oxygen. So we can stabilize and then either transport or connect them to a higher level of care, you know, paramedics. Uh, so uh, you know we carry oxygen. We have an AED. Uh, we also have Narcan uh, on board. So. I've lost track of how many times we went to go pick somebody up because they needed to write a detox, and you get there, and they're lips are turning blue and they're not really breathing and so then we've got to you know give them some narcan wake them up and then get the fire department there um, so we also carry basic need supplies so if we run into somebody that needs shoes or blankets or you know a jacket we have those um, we partner with the um, food flying county which is the food bank in our community and we um, provide non-perishables and snacks so when we see somebody real amped up having a real rough day and you talk to them and they're like well i haven't eaten two days and I'm like oh let's get your blood sugar up and you know yeah. and then hang out with you for a few minutes and you know Nasa see how you're feeling you. and then yeah <laughs> and then we'll be ready to go um yeah yeah it is it's all about you know kind of hitting those basic needs and really just kind of making sure that somebody's got you know security before we can address anything else for them. so up here we'll have our you know our team this third seat here is for um, trainees and observers okay. um, so right now we're actually um uh, training a, a cohort of relief staff uh, and so pretty much anytime you see a van out it's going to have a third person there uh, the people that go out like chelsea and, and matt, matt yeah so are they always the same team or do you mix and match all there's time? there's some alternating uh but there's there's a lot of value in having the same shift partner for a set period of time uh, because you kind of learn your your rhythms uh, mm -hmm. and uh, so matt was my shift partner when i worked on the van for seven years and and that's 24 or 36 hours a week where it was the two of us responding to everything together and so when we would go out for crisis counseling calls he's a medic that's got crisis training we would we would approach the calls together uh, and and had we had a really great back and forth and then when there's a medical call i knew you know he he would say four by four and that meant that i need to go grab the four by four gauze pad and so you know there's there's, and we have each other's backs. We're not armed. Yeah. You know, we're out in some pretty dangerous situations out in the streets, and uh, having that kind of that intimate relationship with each other professionally really makes it a lot easier to stay safe and keep yeah. each other safe. But we're a really tight knit group. There's almost 50 of us. But our our training process is really in depth uh, and requires that you spend a lot of time working with a lot of different teams, so you get to know pretty much everybody. Are the community policing staff also work in the same training? No, uh, 
our, our training is just for our folks um, in-house. We do um, provide de-escalation training and some mental health awareness trainings to the police at their crisis intervention trainings. That's the CIT that uh -huh. everybody does annually. Um, and gosh, we're, um, we actually provide that training to all sorts of community groups uh, throughout the county. Um, we actually helped down in Coose Bay, uh, a mobile crisis program uh, with some, some of their trainings as well. Um, we're talking with a group in Olympia that wants to emulate our model with the police department up there. Um, so this is, you know, we're, we're doing a lot of outreach and education in addition to the crisis response and case management. When, when possible, do you here. try to do a, a gender mix yeah. in, in pairing? Yeah, um, whenever, whenever we can. Um, that just, you know, that's, that's being trauma-informed. Yeah. Um, ultimately, we're going to staff with whoever's available, but yeah. we do try and be tactful with our, with our staffing arrangements. <clears throat> What's the number of staff, women to men? Uh, I mean, because it's social services and mental health in Lane County, um, we're uh, predominantly female. Uh, that's just kind of how a lot of our, you know, uh, partners in the community are, are too. Um, gosh, I don't remember the exact ratio right now. Uh, we're not as ethnically diverse as I would like, and we don't have a lot of Spanish speakers on the team. Um, and that's really, you know, about our recruitment and identifying that we need to reach out to some different community groups. How do, how do you do your recruitment? Uh, a lot of it's word of mouth. Um, we recruit heavily from the Lane Community College EMT program. Um, it's really nice to get EMTs right out of school before yeah. they get the bad habits of the fire department. <laughs> uh, we can get in, provide them a lot more humanistic training, um, and uh, they work with us for a while, and then maybe they move on to the fire department eventually. Um, over the years, we've had a few folks that have gone to the fire department, even the police department. Uh, and that are now kind of helping with a lot of the culture changes that we're having, you know, wow. getting in the community. Uh, wow, well, talk about uh, changing the world. Yeah. Well, we're going to start with this community first. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, really, the changing, world, but, changing but the model of the world. Yeah, yeah, you know, the, this is really, the, C the CUSE program here is, is a, kind of the third branch of public safety. Yeah. You know, you call 911 or you call the non-emergency, you know, police line, and you can get police if it's a crime, you can get fire department if something's burning or you know there's a car crash but if it's a mental health you know or kind of a social socioeconomic need we'll respond um, and by being dispatched to the police departments um, we have a radio so because we're not armed we still have that safety so when somebody wasn't respecting my boundaries in an alleyway and uh, you know kind of kept coming at me I just get on that radio and there's police from you know all directions coming to help us keep the scene calm so we can identify what that person needs and, and if that's do you find that um people living on the streets have a better relationship with the police because they're kind of your backup or your quote-unquote friends mm -hmm. so that since they trust for people that trust you then they learn to trust the police i mean there's st there's still a lot of animosity directed towards the police department uh kind of in the wake of the uh, occupy movements uh, we had a really big encampment here uh, and uh, it put the city at odds with a lot of our uh, unhoused population, and there's there's still some resentment there. Um, it helps that uh, the community knows that the police department, Eugene Police Department, funds the Hughes program, so we're we're good for their image overall. Um, we actually occasionally run into situations where people think that because of our tongue-in-cheek name, that we're an extension of law enforcement. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we do dress a little authoritative, you know, because we need to stand out. So we wear, you know, kind of dark colors and we've got the imposing radio, um, which can be intimidating, but our job is talking to people. And so if they'll give us more than 30 seconds, we're going to be able to uh, build rapport. Kind of a couple of weeks ago, I was here and, and David and I, and a few other people were talking with Mayor Lucy, mm -hmm. and she talked about when, um, when it was time to um, disassemble the uh, Occupy encampment yeah. that the mayor Kitty really approached people from there and yeah. brought them into conversations and that kind of shifted some things and I just heard something slightly different from you yeah. so was there both those things happening there, yeah there was I mean there was a lot of dialogue and it was handled really delicately uh, but you know a lot of the folks that were coming in to the Occupy movement had some pretty well established preconceived notions about law enforcement and the establishment and the fact that the camp wasn't allowed to remain has, you know, kind of influenced their opinions moving forward. Um, so, yeah, I did see Kitty, you know, working and reaching out to people as much as he could. And, you know, some of those folks, I don't think their opinions probably would have changed, you know, that much, hmm. you know, either way. Wow. Staff paid or volunteer? Our staff are all paid. What are they paying? 
Uh, we pay 17 an hour um, right now. Um, that's a, above market rate for uh, a medic in our community. Um, and it's about on par with uh, kind of similar crisis counseling positions elsewhere uh, in the community. I know the original funding, I believe, came from the police department. Is that right? Yeah. So our about 50% of our funding for all of our Eugene services comes from the Eugene Police Department. Uh, and so that um, that patrol, you know, the Eugene vans, we stay within Eugene city limits. In Springfield, uh, we were able to get a grant through the Oregon Performance Plan uh, for mobile crisis intervention. Uh, and uh, that's facilitated by Lane County Health and Human Services, uh, who pays us to, to go into Springfield. And that was really a pilot program to demonstrate kind of the need and the, the value of having us in that community. Um, and that funding runs out um, in uh, June 30, 2019. And at that point, the city of Springfield is going to have to decide whether or not they want to pick us up uh, and fund us moving forward. Um, and that, so, so how, do you, how are you planning to um, tell your story or, or you know, the, for the, yeah. and the government agency to right. want to pick it up? Because that's not, you know, it's, it's not It's not cheap, but... Uh, we're cheaper than uh, the, alternative. You know, the alternative, which is really a lot of emergency room visits and a lot of yeah. law enforcement. I was, seeing, I was thinking, as you were talking originally on the other side, was about your um, the cost savings. Yeah. That you probably have to have a, a really good way of documenting how yeah. your, all the cost savings of every intervention that you yeah. have, which yeah. is saving money on the road. So if, if you're not providing this, this is going to be the cost of the community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I, I don't have the numbers off the top of my head. Uh, and that's... that's for, for some other folks to crunch, uh, but you know, really, we're our cost when you factor in infrastructure and administrative costs, we're still less than seventy dollars an hour to respond. And if we can go out and respond, talk with somebody, identify what's really going on, and prevent an emergency room visit that would have happened by fire department if we weren't available, then you know, just just off the top of my head, we're saving you know a few hundred bucks just because yeah. we didn't have the fire department come out. Right. And then there's cost savings to the hospital and to OHP, uh, you know, and Trillium uh, that are that come from that ER diversion too. I'm feeling a moment of sadness that yeah. um, um, we have a really great um, police chief in our town, mm -hmm. and he is really well versed and a great background in community policing and written yeah. about that. Uh, he's trained in being able to train other people in implicit bias. Mm -hmm. um, and it made a really good point to the city council and they really supported his notion that we're really low on officers, so we yeah. just have increased the number of officers in the process of that. Because there just wasn't enough officers to be able to develop, develop rapport right. uh, and also to be able to respond to more than one right. emergency. Right. And wow, I wish that, that instead of other officers, we could have had other cahoots. Yeah, and it's hard because really, Cahoots, you know, or our, our type of mobile crisis intervention is, as, as much as we do, it's still really a niche, you know, and, and when you're, when you have a pretty tight budget, you know, for a law enforcement agency, you know, you have patrol officers that can respond to anything that gets dispatched. Yeah. We can only respond to the set criteria. But we have the same, we have as much of a need for uh, increasing the community policing part that you right. do by being... Um, uh, user friendlier, yeah. but also um, since uh, our base of mental health services are in our county seat, not in our city, yeah. um, the crisis intervention that you do on the streets is something that we're really missing. Yeah, yes. absolutely. Wow. So, how do you and uh, Eugene, the police department, how are they able to keep the funding going? We're, ju we're just a line item. Uh, and we were up for some budget cuts uh, that would have impacted our service delivery, oh gosh, uh, about five years ago. And uh, a couple of well-placed PSAs and some flyers around town and um, some vocal support at a city council meeting. And they found other places uh, to, to balance the budget out uh, because we've just, you know, we've been, all, we've been established in this community for almost 30 years. Yeah. Uh, so do you have other funding sources as well? We, no, we have two funding sources. Uh, we have City of Eugene and we have our grant and that's that's it. And your grant is? And our, our grant is, is through um, the Oregon Health Authority okay. facilitated by Lane, Lane County Health and Human Services. Okay. And that, that's the one that's running out in 2019. And again, the, the Health and Human Services, that's, mm -hmm. is that consortium of um, Lane County and Eugene and Springfield in terms of funding for that? Um, I think it's just county. Just county? Yeah. 
Yeah, and they're and they're really just facilitating the grant from the state from us. <coughs> that mobile crisis grant that went out uh, that we uh, were able to use for our Springfield services was really intended to be a you know a QMHP driving a Prius around you know, <laughs> with a with a cell phone, and and that, that's a lot cheaper. We were able to really argue our, our utility uh, and then the need in Springfield for our style of mobile intervention, uh, and we're fortunate enough to uh, to be able to move forward with that. How unique is the Cahoots program, say, nationally? Um, well, uh, very. <laughs> in short, uh, there's, a, there's a program in New Orleans that um, works with the police department in um, just one parish uh, that's, that's more of just street outreach and street medicine. Um, there's Cheers in Portland. Uh, which provides, uh, and, and Rose Hips, uh, which provide some aspects of our services, but not kind of the whole picture. Um, and even Cheers up in Portland, they're deputized and can put people on holds to get them into detox or into the hospital. And because we're a voluntary service, our whole model is built on the least intervention necessary. Um, that kind of goes against our philosophy. Um, in the Tenderloin in San Francisco, there's a group called Concern mm -hmm. that has an app that they use to identify folks in crisis that need um, some sort of in-person response. And they actually, when they were developing that whole program, came up here, lived at the main Wiper building, um, and uh, for a couple of weeks, we put them through pretty intensive training, both on the vans and in the classroom setting. And then they've taken that model and uh, you know kind of worked with it to fit the needs of the Tenderloin. Uh, and they're providing that down there. Uh, and then Olympia is actually looking at taking this exact model van with medic and a crisis worker and seeing if it's something that their community would support. Uh, but all of our all of our clients right back here, uh, in part because they don't have the uh, security clearance to wear the police radios or listen to the broadcasts, uh, and just for our own safety protection. Uh, so they're right back here with their gear. The doors don't open from the inside. You know, because if you have somebody that's feeling you know, suicidal and we have a tenuous safety contract to get them to the hospital, we don't want them jumping out in traffic. Right. Does a, a staff person ever ride back there with Yeah. Um, I've ridden back here with folks plenty of times. Um, you know, maybe you got someone that's really nervous about accessing the services that you're going to, and you know, one of us will ride back here and talk with them, you know, just kind of soothe, soothe their concerns. Uh, other times we have somebody that's medically stable, but only just stable, and so then we need to have somebody right back here and just make sure things don't get worse. Is there a gurney for over here? People? No, we don't, um, because we're not a um, we're not a basic life support ambulance. Uh, we don't do gurneys. If somebody needs a stretcher, we're going to call the fire department. Got it. Yeah. <laughs> Safe, legal places to sleep benefits the community by providing options for people otherwise camping illegally, saving public funds needed for cleanup, restoration, law enforcement, and emergency services, providing a structure that encourages individual life improvements, making it easier for social services to connect with those that need their services the most, and providing an environment of peer support which fosters healthy relationships. Pastor Dan showed us around the village which contains 30 micro homes ranging from 60 to 80 square feet in size with common cooking, gathering, restroom and laundry facilities. The village is self-managed by its residents. Dan then took us over to Emerald Village, which is nearly finished, containing 22 homes, each one containing a kitchenette and a bathroom. The residents are members of a housing co-op, which allows them to have a share in the village and a modest asset that can be cashed out when they're ready to move out. So I think what happened today really uh, left me with uh, very sincere questions about why we can't make this progress in our community. Like what are the barriers to um, providing real services? Because what I saw today was that it doesn't include, necessarily include money. I mean, it 
some money, but it's not it's not a, a funding thing, and that's kind of what I've been led to believe is like you know, if we had the money, we would do this or this or this. And and I and I saw you know pro grassroots programs that began and operate still on a really shoestring budget that are doing very real substantial change. And so I'm just I'm very um, curious about exploring what we need to do to um, move forward that doesn't necessarily be, it isn't necessarily budget based. My takeaway from today's field trip to Eugene is that I, I came with the question of how is it that a city can manifest programs and seemingly um, in alignment with what uh, some group or large group or great part of the population believes in or they value. And what I realized is that there are a lot of individual people manifesting based on just their own dreams and moving forward. And some of those dreams happened uh, several decades ago and they've only grown. And other ones are more recent and growing still. I, I saw people that just are creative and seemingly didn't believe anyone else in sense that they couldn't move forward and create something that wasn't happening somewhere else. And that happened both on the physical plane and on creating social situations that people can live together with some amount of self-governance and a decent amount of, of mutual respect. And uh, I come away, I take away with such caring people that have such depth of expertise in what they're doing that they've grown like in the cahoots over what, 30 plus years of experience and it keeps growing and evolving and new people and bringing in the technology of today um, and then uh, with with some of the other tours and the other people that I've met I see this depth of experience and this willingness to share and wanting to see what's what's replicable what can they duplicate of what really works and so i'm excited to see how they can scale that up what they can what they can do around it you can come and check it out in person it's very different than reading an article or something you can't quite get the same thing i imagine but but to me it was very a lot of great deeply committed people making a difference that's also then rippling out to the larger community throughout the state, probably even the country and world.